Good morning, you all, and it is my pleasure to be here tonight, um, taking you through a little journey through uh, data streaming architecture, near real-time transformations, and sharing. My name is Christina Taylor, and I am a data engineer for special projects at Carvana. So I am here with my team of data engineers and or Databricks support team, and welcome. But I want you to take away from today's session that um, no matter what your industry is, um, no matter you're from, this is all based by the best in class open source technology. So if you're thinking about streaming, if you are thinking about uh, near real time, you can implement something like this. Prior to Carvana, I worked uh, as a founding engineer as a fintech startup. Um, prior to that, I was on the launch team of Disney+. Plus. So no matter what your industry, I hope you walk away with something relevant. So uh, let's get started. Uh, I want to start with a little bit of motivation on how we arrived where we are today. An increasingly popular architectural choices by many of our application teams and our data producers. What is it? That is the microservices architecture. Uh, microservice architecture replaces complex monolithic application instances with a collection of small, loosely coupled services. So each of the services often has its own code base, its database, a small development can manage and scale them. So there are a lot of benefits for using this architecture. So your app teams can develop and test autonomously. Um, you can scale your services independently. You can organize your services by business capacity, keep your separate code bases, distribute CI, CD, and achieve data isolation. But there are also criticisms of this approach. So it adds complexity to your system. Network latency becomes a concern. So among the services, there are boundaries and information barriers. And here is data team's favorite question. So where is my data integrity and aggregation? Now it is as if the app teams today and data teams have conflicting priorities. So I'm reminded of a favorite quote of mine from building microservices. So remember when we talked about the core principles behind good microservices, strong cohesion, lose coupling, but with database integration, we lose both things. So your app teams want to make your API calls one at a time. They want each services to be independent from each other, but your data team often wants to centralize and scale and aggregate. So here's like a typical example of a microservices architecture if each service has its own choice of deployment, often different databases, but when it comes time for your data team to understand you know, just how much business have we done, say, in a single given day. Now, we have like a very confused data person here. So how do I bring together data from all this variety of services and sources together for the first time? Another change data capture. You've heard from um, the previous presenters what all the cool kids are doing today, right? So what is CDC? It refers to the process of identifying and capturing changes made to data in a database and then delivering those changes in near real time to a downstream process or system. Now, there are so many different solutions, vendorized, open source, um, that can offer you some answers. So I will take you through briefly two systems I have evaluated and implemented. So on the left side, we have Amazon Managed Database Migration Service. On the right side, we have its open source alternative, Divisium. So any CDC, change, uh, CDC system, so it works with creating a one-time snapshot of your service database and ongoing replication. So for DMS, it supports a wide range of commercial and open source databases, um, both database and S3 targets, it can handle many of the DDL changes. So be careful here, because uh, many vendorized solutions require you to redeploy the service if the schema changes in the upstream. And um, be mindful of your targets. So if you want something like an unlimited sync, maybe you should consider choosing S3 instead of Redshift as your target. 
And for those who are more adventurous, uh, of course, there's an open source distributed platform called Divisium. It uses a log-based change data capture. It does require you to deploy your own Kafka Connect, uh, and Divisium server um, supports a variety of sources and targets, and you can do a lot more customization there, including uh, filtering, masking, and transforming your messages in, in real time. Now, um, you might have a change data capture architecture like this. So your service databases, something like an AWS migration service, and Databricks autoloader that can simplify your file ingestion, and uh, your Delta Lake and BI tools or reporting data warehouses. Now, I want to share with you a little bit of insight um, of my experience deploying this architecture across three tenants, five deployments, and about 20 databases each. And here's our very long motivation for data streaming. So what worked? Change data capture worked very well with big data. It scales up to the terabytes, and it's incredibly stable for um, like slow changing stable systems when there are few schema changes. Uh, remember, most of the CEC solutions might require you to redeploy the service on schema change upstream. Um, and, but the deployment itself, if you want to automate this using something like a Terraform, what you can or what you cannot um, automate might be an art. And you learn by mistakes what type of DDL changes are supported, what is not. And that brings us to perhaps the most important challenges for changing the capture at a schema change. So imagine you have an ever-changing, evolving microservices. To do change data capture on such frequent schema changes seems incredibly difficult, that not to say that the business logic that contained within the service might be lost between your service and data layers. Now, how would we address this challenge? So in response to these challenges, an event streaming framework was more. Um, what are events? What are streams? So event streams are sequences of business activities ordered by time. And data streaming, as we mentioned it, often consists of applications publishing and consuming events. So uh, consumer programs will typically aggregate, filter, and enrich the information in near real time. And how do we express events in terms of business context? Um, one of the frameworks you can use is called cloud events. So it is just a specification that describes event data in a common way. Let me show you what it might look like in practice. So this is a cloud event specification. So in which you have some standard um, aspects such as like the identifier of your event, the source, version, blah, blah, blah. But um, in the cloud event header, there's also opportunities for your application teams to add uh, further attributes, such as uh, schema ID, schema version, or anything custom that you think would be useful to the consumers. So I'm going to come back to the schema ID and version in a little bit. Uh, but let's dive into a data streaming our system architecture for a bit. Now, these are the main components of a data streaming application. Um, I'm going to start with transactional outbox. We'll not do a deep dive into what that is, but know that this is a um, way to solve for eventual consistency. So for those who are less familiar with eventual consistency, fascinating subject in the distributed system. If you're curious, look up uh, for the stack overflow answer. But on a high level, so imagine there are three servers, right? So that's you, uh, me, your neighbor, and your client here, uh, your neighbor's wife. And depending on when the three of us watch the latest weather report, and depending on how and when the three of us communicated with each other and caught up, and when your neighbor's wife asked for the weather information from one of us. So she, the client, 
might walk away with incorrect information on what is the current weather and what is the forecast. So think about that. Uh, but the transactional outbox pattern is one of the ways we can solve for eventual consistency. So this is something that you might not deal with in the change data capture system. So because CDC is an eventual consistent system, but um, uh, in the distributed message queue, you might want to keep that in mind. But um, anyway, so one of the ways we can solve this is to use an outbox pattern. So essentially, it involves a two-step transaction. So the initial commit of the messages to an outbox table from your service, and the separate process, for lack of a better word, let me call it a scanner service, um, a separate process that pulls changes in the outbox table and then publish services, uh, sorry, publish messages to a queue based on what is in your outbox table. And the producers don't have to worry about when the consumers would be ready. And um, this way, your event schema is not tied to um, your actual database schema. This is uh, in vast contrast with a CDC system in which, say, if you're using autoloader, so any changes in your upstream uh, change data that might get immediately reflected in your data lake. But um, um, in event-based systems, you can achieve separation between your message schema and your actual database schema. Now, um, at the core of this diagram for a data person, now we come to the schema registries. Um, what is it? So schema registry is how you establish the contract between your data producers and data consumers. And essentially, it's just a RESTful interface for you to store and receive schemas. Um, Confluent, for example, provides such a schema registry service, and it is free to use, at least as of today, for the customers who are on Confluent Cloud. But that's not to say that you cannot build your schema registry service yourself. It's pretty straightforward. And um, I'm going to take you through some of the components and how it works. So typically, you can have um, your application in your CI CD process register your schema in the schema registry service. And in the process, you can enforce things like compatibility check. So here's a comprehensive list of all the compatibility definitions. Um, I want to make a pretty important clarification. So what is probably most relevant to data teams of today is the forward compatibility. Some people might call it backward compatible, but that's OK. What it really means is the producer updates first, and the consumer can update at leisure. What, and what does that mean? Um, so the newer version of events with a newer version of schema can still be read and processed by the older version of consumers. OK. Um, so what I mean here by for compatibility is update your application, but your data and business teams can update their consumers at leisure. OK. And how do you enforce that? So for instance, if you use the Confluent Schema Registry, you can enable a schema compatibility check. And your app team may not be able to deploy if it's breaking data team's application and the schema is not for compatible. Think about that. I can give you an example. Like adding a column is usually for compatible, but dropping a column, probably not. Arbitrarily changing a column's name, probably not either. OK. So let's get into a little more into the actual schema files. So here's an example in Avro, right? Uh, this is defined in JSON format. OK, so I got something like a checkout service. It has a field called customer name, and the data type is string, right? OK, not super interesting. But there are actually additional attributes in your Avro specification less used that will become far more interesting and relevant to the data teams. Let's take a look at these. So in Avro schema definition, you can alias a field. Oh, OK, now I know customer name used to be called name or username. Better, 
Um, there's also a doc, uh, a document field where you, you can add a description of the field. So pause for a minute, think about it. I hope you are as excited as I am about this because what is this when you explore the schema definition? This is your organization's free data dictionary. So how powerful is that? Please, I want you to give it up to the data-minded application teams. <laughs> All right, so a little bit of fun. Let me show you a code snippet, how you can deserialize Avro messages. So you might see, okay, from Confluent Avro, do not worry, this is a completely open source library. There is just another method called um, uh, from Avro. So the reason that mm, I had this over here is if you're using Confluent Schema Registry, so know that Confluent Avro format adds magic bytes at the beginning um, of the Avro file. So keep that in mind. And you can tweak uh, your Schema Registry configuration uh, on the deserialization strategy. And uh, here are some examples on how you can flatten this information. And if you're using Cloud Event context, uh, context, remember the specification I just showed you. Um, so in the header structure, you can extract information, um, schema version, schema ID, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so why am I doing this? Um, as anyone who's writing for a data consumer application Know this, your producer can never be 100% trusted. So a lot of schema registry services boast for schema validation. What does that really mean? So I will tell you the confluent one by schema validation, it actually should be called probably schema ID validation. What it means is when you send a schema to confluent schema registry, it is required for you to put in the actual uh, record and the schema ID. That is not to say, like, technically there's nothing to prevent a wicked data producer to send the correct schema ID with the incorrect message. So think about that. <laughs> um, so you might want to monitor your dead letter queue very carefully, or you might want to do some kind of periodic schema validation on your data consumer. Okay, so keep that in mind. Producers cannot be trusted. <laughs> okay, so um, in a streaming data platform, you might have a system architecture like this. Um, you would have a continuously stream of um, event data being updated into your delta tables. And now, how would I achieve near real-time transformation and uh, serving my data consumers? I want to spend a little more time on Delta Live tables and Delta sharing. Disclaimer, this is not a technical deep dive session. There are so many, there's been so many great sessions throughout the summit about DLT and Delta sharing. And I strongly encourage you to check it out because we believe this is the best and an open standard in class. Uh, what I want to share with you today is a little bit of data engineering perspective for someone who's um, one of the earliest beta testers for both of these technologies. So, um, Delta Live tables. So in my mind, a Delta Live tables pipeline can coordinate the data flow between your uh, queries. So many of us here now today are familiar with the bronze, silver, gold data layer separation. And as I can show you in this pretty simple snippet here, lots of goodies in three very little uh, notebooks. So for, in one end, I've created the separation between raw ingestion, uh, my filter clans and augmented tables, and my business level aggregated data. Uh, look here, so quality bronze silver um, gold. So it's very transparent to the data teams and users what um, this workflow produces. And here, this is how your analytics folks might be able to turn um, a streaming live data in your cloud storage into usable, actionable insight in a matter of hours. 
So I used to write a, some really complicated CDC injection code. Uh, okay, I gotta mm, check the timestamp and worry about it arriving out of order and think that I didn't accidentally insert a record after the delete, blah, blah, blah. But Delta Live tables takes care of that complexity behind the hood. So you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to re-engineer all that code. Just think about your business logic, um, think about your query. So let DLT take care of that complexity for you. Um, you might notice here, okay, so I've got three steps in this workflow. I have Python code and SQL code. And to that, in our opinion, it's very empowering for the data teams to collaborate. The people now can work in the language they are mostly comfortable with without having to re-engineer the entire Spark UDF or relearn how to write the business logic in PySpark. And I used to run um, Scala code in PySpark. So it was very ugly, so I, what did I do? I passed the data frame around. Okay, high key, kind of works. Uh, but with DLT, you don't have to do that to mix languages. And this is very, very powerful. Um, and the last one, I want to mention is if you look over here, there's a constraint um, declaration in this gold table. This is how you can mm, use built-in like data quality check and even some business, uh, business logic. So all of your um, thoughts, mm, the logic from ingestion to augmentation to cleansing can live in one place. So um, a little bit of a takeaway on my impression of DLT. So seamless collaboration between your data engineers and data analysts and um, data scientists. Continuous execution without the complexity stream processing of recovery logic. Um, read stream, any cloud file source, extremely powerful um, low-code solution. And you can define your quali data quality um, business rules in one declarative pipeline. And what I didn't show you, but you might have seen it in some of the earlier demos, is the data lineage graph. So you can see very clearly um, the relationship of, between your brown, silver, and gold tables. So think about like dbt doc serve. For those of you who are maybe more familiar with that framework, you got that in DLT, like a similar functionality in DLT as well with the ability to work on near real-time streaming data. And I would say very few data transformation frameworks today can say that. Okay, a mm, little more honorable mention for data sharing. So again, a data engineer's perspective. So on a very high level, um, the way it works is your data provider generates a short-lived uh, URL for your recipients, and your recipients use a credential file to access a, a portion of your Delta Lake. So, okay, so the benefits goes without sh uh, saying, you can share your live data without duplication, so no more CSV exports, compressions, SFTPs, hashtag always on call, we love those. Um, it supports a wide range of recipients which means um, your recipients do not need to be a Databricks customer. Your recipient does not need to be a Spark user. So you can connect with the Pandas API, you can connect with your uh, BI application, it works just fine. And if you're using um, Unity Catalog, you, um, you add built-in data security, audience governance in one interface, and it scales up to massive data sets. So a little bit of a call out here as someone who has implemented external tables pointing to a portion of your data lake. So with Delta sharing, you can easily um, share out a partition or a table or a view. And you don't have to worry about things like manifests and especially when it comes to um, like partition external tables or um, like or only a subset, your recipients can always see a consistent view as opposed to external tables. So keep that in mind. Very, very 
um, very important and very painful lesson I had to learn uh, using external tables. Um, it, and especially at the source, there are frequent schema changes. So your delta tables can perhaps automatically handle that, but your external table will not. So you have to think about some ways to update it. So yada yada, and external tables, that's technically not the means, the best ways something should be used, and it's always slower. Uh, all right, so with that, uh, I'm going to close out my session, and um, thank you very much for being here with me this morning in person and virtually. Uh, I'll hang out for a few minutes so that folks can ask questions offhand. We do have uh, another speaker coming in, so forgive me. I'm happy to chat either on LinkedIn or here. Enjoy the rest of your summit and enjoy the snake cup parade at home. Thank you.